Only our cameras were there as Dior Johnson walked into court today facing felony assault and strangulation charges. San Isidro High School basketball star Mikey Williams is facing multiple charges tonight related to a shooting in Hamul. Getting punched by his own players. Kicked off the team after he was charged with you. Police say two student athletes were just arrested in connection with a move mm -hmm. that took place last month. Yeah, okay, so if you click this video, I'm assuming you enjoy basketball in some capacity. And if that's the case, you and I got something in common. What's good? My name is OA, also known as OA Shot It. I'll be shooting sh Anyway, so I've been filming high school sports for about four years now, and I can truly say from the bottom of my heart, it's one of God's greatest gifts to mankind. I've seen NBA stars in their early stages. I've seen <laughs> get their whooped on court by their own teammates. I've seen a lot of sh I mean, I love it. It's raw. It's the purest form of basketball next to going outside and just dribbling on your own. And it's raw for a reason. I mean, aside from the fact that the refs don't get paid enough to give a f about the oh games the refereeing, these are all just kids bro these are teenage boys and it's easy to forget because of just how good these kids are at such young ages but they will remind you real fast i mean these kids are not playing for a paycheck or not all of them anyways but <laughs> these kids are playing for pride they're playing for offers free college they're playing for goddamn school spirit i mean some of these kids are just playing to stay out of trouble shit is low-key crazy to think about but let me stop yapping let me stop yapping sometimes these emotions go unchecked at the end of the day, basketball is just a small portion of these kids' lives with a lot of other moving parts. No way you showed this fast break mess. Ah, sure. Sometimes on the bench. these kids lose <laughs> their damn mind. And it can get scary. These are some of the darkest and wildest stories in high school basketball. Let's lock in. This video is in iceberg format, which means the stories will be progressively wilder as they go on, I guess. I don't fucking know, bro. Just watch the video. Press it up. I got some ice in my cup. Press it up. I got some ice. Surely, if you clicked on this video, you have some idea of who Mikey Williams is. But if you don't, or you've been living under Hell a rock nah. for the last three years, I'll explain. Mikey Williams was essentially the high school basketball player of the last decade, as he was pretty much one of the most popular we've seen in recent times. Mikey was shoved into the spotlight early on, dating back to middle school, where he gained notoriety playing with Bronny James on a stacked blue chips team. He was one of the most exciting players, not only in that crazy 2023 class, but in the entirety of high school basketball, and it came quickly. His freshman year was one of the most memorable we've ever seen. Buddy was going viral like every damn week. You could not scroll social media without seeing some sort of crazy dunk or him posting an insane box score. Like, this kid scored 77 points as a 15 year old. 77. Shit, some of y'all ain't even scored that this whole season. But that's enough glazing. My bad, my bad. You could argue Mikey's stardom sort of tapered off in the following years as he transferred to three different schools in those three years. But nonetheless, Mikey was massively successful, touching millions of dollars before the age of 18 off brand deals, one being Puma, with whom he signed with to become the first ever high school basketball player to sign a shoe deal, amongst many others. But as we all know, Mo money, mo problems. On March 28, 2023, a 911 call was made by someone claiming to have been shot at by Mikey Williams at his mansion in San Diego the night before. The story to this day is still super vague, but it, it goes something like this. A group of five individuals pull up to Mikey's mansion in an Uber, including two girls and three guys. One of the girls amongst the group was in contact with another resident of the home, who we now know was <laughs> Allegedly, allegedly. Then an argument breaks out between <laughs> and the guests after the guests request a quote unquote walkthrough of the house, whatever the fuck that means. To this day, we do not know what escalated the argument or why exactly those five people really pulled up in the first place, but I'm sure some of you have some decent guesses. At some point, Mikey comes outside with a handgun and fires an unspecified- but For what though? It's the question. Nigga just plays basketball. He's like 17, 18. Number of shots at the vehicle, with one hitting the rear of said vehicle. Nobody got hit, but at that point, the damage had already been and done. And they snitched? Officers responded to the initial 911 call almost three weeks later on April 13th, where they executed a search warrant at Mikey's house. He was arrested the next day, facing six whole felony charges, including five charges of assault with a deadly weapon and one count of firing into an occupied vehicle. Had he been found guilty of these charges, he would have done 30 years in prison. Insane shit, bro. Luckily, his lawyers were on demon timing because he somehow beat this case. Mikey took a plea deal to a much lesser felony charge of making a criminal threat, and as a result, he was ordered to complete a gun safety course 
attend anger management classes and do 80 hours of community service, which with all things considered is an insane slap on the wrist. Provided that he doesn't get in trouble with the law again, the charge can even get downgraded to a misdemeanor. Mikey's currently at the University of Central Florida where he's slated to be back on the court next fall. Good luck, Mikey. Copyright is crazy, but I, I guess. Looking back at the 2022 recruiting class is always interesting because at the time it seemed so incredibly stacked that some considered it borderline generational. And with all things considered, and I'm admittedly being a prisoner at the moment right now, it kind of was. I mean, let's look back. When you look at the top 30 ranked players in that 247 composite, you see that 17 were drafted one and done. That's more than half that are already in the league currently playing in their rookie season. Four are projected to be taken in this year's draft, including Kyle Filipowski, Tyrese Proctor, Kalel Ware, and Adem Bona, which leaves nine players who are each currently thugging it out doing their thing in college, right? Fuck no. There is one player that's not enrolled in any school right now doing Lord knows what, and sadly, he just so happens to be one of the most talented players I've ever seen with The Rock. Let's talk about Arterio Morris. Now, Arterio was about as unique of a player as it gets. Coming out of Kimbo High School in Dallas, Texas, everyone in the city knew that he was special very early on. He showcased a distinctive style of play incorporating a silky smooth handle to go with elite athleticism and change of pace with a certain level of dog you just wasn't gonna match. Although the city always recognized Terrio as one of the best players in the country, it took him some time to get recognition on a national scale as he didn't earn a three-star ranking until the tail end of his sophomore year in early 2020. He had ambitions much higher Damn. than three stars though, which resulted in him transferring to prolific prep for a brief stint, and then he was right back to Kimball in time for his junior year. A couple of spectacular AAU campaigns, a few thousand Instagram and TikTok followers, and state championship losses later, and Terrio was a household name to anybody who knew anything about high school sports. At this point, he was a consensus five-star recruit, ranked as the number two point guard in the nation, and would commit to play for Chris Beard's Texas Longhorns in July 2021 before earning a McDonald's All-American nod, an invite to the Iverson Classic, and a bunch of other honors. But uh, following the theme of the video, these niggas can't stay out their own way. So let me just tell you how shit hit the fan. On the night of July 12, 2022, a long Instagram post was posted by Terrio's then girlfriend at the time, accusing Terrio of some very illegal things. I'll throw some screenshots up, but to paraphrase it, the expose essentially detailed how Terrio would abuse her. The caption would illustrate a grim picture of her and Terrio's relationship, stating things like how he would quote, nah, Britain at peak is crazy. She prayed on his downfall and it worked to beat on me and punch on me if I didn't stay with him, which escalated to him, quote, grabbing her, snatching her up by her clothes and violating her because she broke up with him. She would describe instances of him driving all the way from Austin to Dallas, which is a three hour trip, to pop up at her place of work and argue. A separate instance told of a time where Terrio came to her job, threatened to break her car windows, managed to take her keys and throw them in a ditch so she couldn't leave. The final straw came when Terrio, quote, grabbed her by the left wrist and pulled her up off the bed and then grabbed at her sports bra near her chest and pulled, which caused a, quote, three inch long abrasion on her neck. Y'all get the point. Shortly after this incident, 911 was called to the house. According to the affidavit, during initial questioning, Terrio told police that there was no physical contact made between him and the victim, essentially telling police he didn't touch her. However, after police saw the bruises on the victim's neck, Terrio quote unquote altered his initial statement, which is obviously a big ass no-no. He was then placed under arrest and charged with assault causing bodily injury to a family member, a class A misdemeanor. According to the post, she would then file a restraining order on Terrio, which was easily granted. The protective order stated that he was not allowed to contact her nor be within 500 feet of her and that any violation would be an automatic felony, but that didn't really stop anything. Now, according to the caption, it's not really clear in which order these events took place, but in the post, she would include videos of Terrio being put in cuffs and arrested by police, audio recordings of him making threats toward her, screenshots of him brandishing a gun, and text messages between the two, amongst other things. It hit social media like a typhoon, quickly spreading and becoming the topic of discussion amongst Dallas residents and high school basketball fans alike. The most inquiring minds belong to Texas Longhorn faithfuls though, not only for the obvious concerns with the allegations surrounding their brand new five-star recruit, but one very interesting detail. As I said before, the allegations came out on July 12th. However, Terrio was booked into jail June 2nd. For you smart people out there, that is an entire one month and 10 day period where absolutely nothing took place. No statements, no announcements, no suspensions, nothing. 
They kind of just pretended the whole situation never happened. Longhorn fans would question why no action was taken, as there was no chance that the school and staff were unaware that this was going on. People questioned why the situation wasn't handled more swiftly, why he wasn't cut from the team before things got messy. Of course, you had your usual crowd of absolute dorks who blamed the victim for trying to quote unquote ruin his career and yada 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 whatever. As some of you may or may not know, this was not the nail in the coffin for Arterio's career at all. Terrio was able to play a full season afterwards, putting a respectable 4.8 points, 1.4 rebounds, and 0.5 assists per game. Mm. He would enter the transfer portal at the end of the season and, well, you know, well, some well, other- Well, well, Yep. Yeah. D Damn, bro. Fuck. If that's not the word, I don't even want to know what's next. Things would happen, but uh, that's a story for another day. Yeah, today is in fact another day. <laughs> Basically, the story that I wasn't prepared to share earlier was the fact that Terrio entered the transfer portal and ended up at the University of Kansas. But before the season even started, Terrio had an open case in the state of Kansas for an accusation of rape, and he was subsequently cut from the team. Obviously, it'd be a slippery ass slope to, for me to talk about it, given the fact that it wasn't like said and done or whatever. And all the facts hadn't yet come out. I think at that point, the only thing released was like an affidavit. And that's obviously not enough to convict a nigga of a crime. Um, He hadn't even gone to trial yet. I would like to go in depth about the details of the accusations, but I, that doesn't really serve any purpose, given the fact that nothing came out of them. But if you are curious, I guess you could just search it up on your own. Nigga, I ain't talking about that shit. But yeah, as of Tuesday, April 9th. The case is now closed. Terrio posted some paperwork on his Instagram basically saying that the case was closed due to a lack of evidence. So, uh, yeah, um, I hope that boy can stay out of trouble get back on the court. You know what I'm saying? Do, do his thing. Yeah. Zach Brown. In the last entry, I talked a bit about how it's so fascinating to me to see how these graduating classes of Hoopers pan out. Some live up to the expectations put upon them, putting up stats and maintaining their rankings all throughout high school and keeping their reputation all the way to the association. Names like Anthony Edwards and Zion Williamson Go. come to mind. These players are exactly who we thought they were. No on job. the flip side, Crazy. however, it's very common for kids to be highly touted early on and then fizzle out later. For natural reasons, though. Some kids peak way too early. Their peers catch up to them physically and then they begin to look way less dominant as time passes on. Some players just don't work as hard as they should have, relying on their athleticism instead of developing and improving their skill sets. What isn't as common, however, is being the motherfucker in the class that gets forgotten because you're a crash out. And mm. you transition from a man to a woman. Like Zach Brown. No, not that Zach Brown. This Zach Brown. There's a reason you have no idea who this is. Let's get into it. Zach Brown was a 7'1 center in the 2017 class from Miami, Florida. Growing up, he was one of those kids that was always bigger than everybody around him. In fact, Zach was 6'2 by the age of 10. It was never going to be anything but basketball for young Zach. But the path to the conventional hoop dream was a little more hectic than most. Now believe me when I say he comes from extremely humble beginnings. Zach was the youngest of five boys, all taken care of by a single mother in the tough neighborhood of Overtown, one of the worst areas in Miami. I don't have to go into much detail about what goes down in Overtown, but just know the violent crime rate is about 127% higher than the national Golly. average. Anyway, Zach and his family lived in poverty, like real deal poverty. It wasn't uncommon for Zach, who again, was a big ass kid, to wear clothes that were several sizes too small. He and his brothers were no strangers to making ends meet as they would commonly steal food and clothes when things got sparse. He'd recall the story of a time where his mom was hospitalized for an entire month because of a heart condition. Zach and his brothers would sleep at the hospital to stay close to their mother day in and day out until the day they were finally kicked out. Once they returned to their apartment, the lights were cut out. The bills weren't paid, but that was regular for him. At the age of 12, the state took custody of him and his brothers after his mother failed a drug test and was deemed unfit to be a parent. The judge over the case claimed their living situation was, quote, one of the worst he'd ever seen with not much further details. So we can only imagine what exactly was going on in that home. After bouncing around from foster home to foster home over and over again, they'd be sent to live with their aunt, which would stand to become a blessing in disguise. By this point, Zach was six foot five in the seventh grade, but had never played a game of organized basketball in his life, nor did he have any interest in doing so it was only when his aunt's neighbor saw how physically imposing he was at such a young age probably thinking to himself why your big ass not playing basketball and referred him to michael Pretty Littman, much. the owner of a now defunct eybl team called the south beach all-stars that his life would change for good 
Lippman would convince Zach to play for his team, but there was much work to be done as Zach was about as coordinated as a baby giraffe. But Zach showed work ethic and promise. And by the eighth grade, he'd already become one of the best prospects in the country. Life would change off the court too, as he would move in with Lippman and become an adoptive member of the family. Although his new home, located in the tranquil upper class neighborhood of Cocoa Beach, was only 10 minutes away from his old home in Overtown, to Zach, it might as well have been a completely different side of the planet. Fast forward a little later and Zach is a five-star recruit averaging 19 points, 17 rebounds, and eight blocks per game with offers from schools like Virginia, Miami, Kentucky, and UConn, the latter of which he would commit to later on. Mm -hmm. This is about as good as it would get for Zach though, as the next year or so of his life would be the most tumultuous sequence of self-inflicted bullshit I'm I've ever heard of in my do. life. The first it had to be some, nah, I'm not gonna assume, that sounds crazy assuming. First domino fell in January 2016 when Zach transferred to Putnam Science Academy, a prep school yeah, of- Watch your cook, bruh. Motherfucker won't stay. Like, what is that? About 20-ish minutes away from the UConn campus. On the surface, the transfer made a lot of sense. Zach had just committed to UConn. Why wouldn't he take the opportunity to play at one of the better prep schools in the country while getting himself acclimated to the environment he'd be living in in preparation to go to the league? Well... The reason Zach left in the first place wasn't that cut and dry. Right before he moved, Zach had gotten into an on-court altercation during a game in late December. To keep it sweet, hands were thrown. Lippman was quoted saying that Zach didn't start the fight, claiming he was provoked, but it didn't matter because Zach for damn sure finished it. The suspension was indefinite, right in the middle of what was essentially crunch time for most teams trying to make a playoff push. And Zach's 28 points, 15 rebounds, and nine blocks per game would not be easy to replace. I'd like to make it clear that getting into one fight doesn't make you a crash dummy or a menace to society or anything like that. And it's not an indictment on one's character, especially if you were provoked like Zach's guardian claimed he was. However, it would happen again. Zach, after only being at PSA for a grand total of two weeks, would get into another on-court fight. This time around was a little more serious. Putnam had a strict no-fight policy, which would effectively end his stint at the school for good. Mm. Damn. Zach would move back to Miami, which was seemingly becoming a more toxic environment for him between family problems and increasing concerns surrounding him maintaining his grades. To add insult upon injury, he would decommit from UConn, and you can't see me, but I'm doing air quotes, on the 5th of May. Now this is where it gets crazy. Three weeks later on Memorial Day, the news broke that Zach had been arrested facing charges of armed robbery, five counts of credit card fraud, and multiple counts of robbery by sudden snatch, according to Metro Dade Police. God damn! Oh my god, nigga just said fuck basketball. I'm going back to my old ways, old ways, old ways. I'm not gonna say that other term. Let me explain something to y'all. This nigga basically got hit with a Rico. This dude, on multiple occasions, was going into stores, taking merchandise, and using stolen credit. 25k? Yeah, god damn, get that thug off the court. Of course. We have now officially entered crash out territory. Zach will post a $25,000 bail and was out soon after. This resulted in Michael Littman, his one-time guardian, severing ties with him, and he would subsequently reunite with his mom and brother back in Overtown. Now, in most cases, this would essentially be career ending. Zach's baggage was becoming a little too much to bear, and between two on-court altercations and the armed robbery, it seemed like Zach's story was coming to an ugly-ass ending. However, he was thrown a lifeline. Zach's cases were dropped following a lack of evidence, and he was focused on getting back on the court and getting his life back on track as soon as possible. All the shenanigans caused him to slide in the rankings, so he dropped the star. But he was still a four-star, ranked the number ninth center in the class of 2017, and he still had undeniable talent. And although UConn didn't see him as a part of their future, plenty of college coaches did. He would commit to St. John's University on July 21st, 2016. Things were looking up for young Zach. And then they were. Zach would enroll at Sarasota Prep for his senior season. For some reason, he didn't stick there either and would transfer to Calusa Prep in October, which would be his final high school. Now, if you're keeping track, that's four schools in less than a year. Never a good sign. But anyways, Zach would fly under the radar and sign his letter of intent with St. John's in November. He managed to stay out of the news until January when, you guessed it, he was arrested again for robbing a Walgreens. He was waiting in line and out the blue reached into the cash register, grabbed money, and dipped. And this time, his big stupid ass was caught on camera. Take a look.
really, nigga? This is such a nigga moment. Oh my gosh. He didn't even. It probably once, because I bet you them bills were sorted out. He probably took some ones. It was definitely not worth it. This is crash out level. Mm, I give him 27. So, obviously, there's a strong lack of discretion with Buddy. You know when you have an intrusive thought that comes and goes and you think to yourself, damn, I'm tripping for thinking that, but that's all it is, an intrusive thought? Yeah, Zach's intrusive thoughts turn into action all the time. That little voice in your head that calms you down when you're about to make a decision that can create a bad consequence, I think Zach lacks it. Now, I understand Zach had a very rough upbringing and a lack of decent parental figures, and I understand you're simply a product of your environment. But like, bruh, you seven feet tall trying to rob a Walgreens. You thought you was going to get away with that shit? And let's be real. A Walgreens of all places, not even a Walmart or a Target. Man, and if that wasn't wacky enough, Zach tried to do the race after making off with his little change. He tried to outrun the police. They would obviously catch up to him and arrest him. And in the process, police found out he was driving with a suspended license for unpaid parking tickets. At this point. The hoop dream was completely finished, as St. John's would release him from his NLI a little over a week later. Oh, you thought that was it? What DJ Khaled said? Another one. Zach Oriah Brown would be arrested one more time a month later. The Why, fuck? you ask? Failure to show up to court. And no, you're not bugging. Zach had- Nigga showed up in disguise. He tried to fool them. Has makeup on in this mugshot. There's also this video that went viral a couple years back that was confirmed to be him as well. Take a look. I, I, I don't fucking know. Now, obviously, as of today, this story is about seven years old. You may be wondering, whatever became of Zach? Maybe he got his life together, got back on the court, and is playing basketball in some capacity. Hell Maybe no. somewhere in Puerto Rico or Uzbekistan or something. You'd be wrong. Zach Brown is now Jessica Turberry. We can only hope she's staying out of trouble and living her best life. This nigga switched sides. Uh, good for her. For her. I guess. Fuck, bro. Okay, I feel like I got to preface this next story by saying um, my tone is going to be a little different. It might get a little silly. Uh, and that's because this nigga is Where just an at? idiot fucking degenerate. But I like to make it very clear, like, ain't shit about this next one funny at all. <laughs> I mean, it might be a little funny. For those of you who are former athletes, whether you just grew up and graduated, or maybe you suffered an injury that cut your career short, or maybe you just fucking suck and you got cut from like JB or something. Damn. Okay. You all know deep down somewhere you wish you could have done things just a little differently. I know at least once you wish you could go back in time and put just a little bit more work in, take shit more seriously, and maybe undo some costly mistakes. For a lot of athletes, it's hard to imagine themselves living a life outside of their sport. And that's completely normal. It be like that sometimes. You move on though. Life goes on. Unless you are Sydney Gilstrap. Portly. In 2017, Sidney Gilstrap Portly was sitting on the porch of his East Dallas apartment, reflecting on the current state of his life. To keep it simple, Sidney was depressed. He would reminisce about how he came to be at the spot he was at. Sidney grew up with a typical hood baby origin story. He was an only child raised by a teenage single mother, not necessarily because his father didn't want anything to do with him, but because he was in and out of jail. Sidney's father, Sidney Sr., racked up a shit ton of different charges, including 16 felonies and misdemeanors, ranging from aggravated assault to attempted burglary. Clearly, that boy was in love with jail. In any damn. event, Sidney and his mother weren't used to stability, to say the least. They bounced around a lot, from home to home, accepting shelter from any relative that offered. His escape from that came from basketball, of course. Naturally, it was his first love. Sidney was a big fan of LeBron James, so much so that he watched more than a game, the documentary about LeBron and his high school teammates, every day after school. He saw himself in LeBron, a determined kid with an absent father who was able to rise above it. Now, Sidney wasn't blessed with a 6'8 frame and generational athleticism, but he was a special hooper in his own way. To be completely honest though, the little nigga just wasn't that good. Although talented, he didn't make varsity until his senior year of high school, and even then, he was never able to become a starter, only really ever playing scrub minutes or in blowouts. Sidney had a reputation as a ball hog, rarely passing to his teammates, and he'd fight his coaches as well. 
I'm sure some of y'all can relate. Sydney's dream of being like his idol was slowly slipping away from him and it took a toll on his mental. He started drinking before games and picking fights with his teammates. Midway through the season, his coaches had enough and cut him loose. After graduation, Sydney would try for several JUCO and D3 schools, but his reputation as a bad teammate kept coaches from taking any legit flyer on him. He was able to play a little bit at Dallas Christian College, but didn't even finish a full season and couldn't stick anywhere else. So Sydney's basketball career was effectively over. Until it wasn't. Six years later, in 2017, a devastating hurricane wreaks havoc on the southernmost region of Texas, with Houston taking the brunt of the damage. Hurricane Harvey caused catastrophic flooding, hundreds of millions of dollars in damage, and claimed 103 lives. It had everybody in the state of Texas's attention, including Sydney's. Still stuck in that same spot he was at six years earlier, 24-year-old Sydney desperately craved a change of pace. So he did what any other normal person in his position would do. Got a damn job? No. Hit the gym? Nope. Went to church and prayed on it? The mosque? Hell nah. Sydney arrived at Skyline High School in Dallas, claiming he was a 17-year-old Hurricane Harvey refugee from Houston named Rashun. Oh my gosh, this is like, he is literally embodiment of peak in high school, but he literally got a shit high school experience which is like blowing me right now nigga lied oh my gosh that's crazy like child application scared he could not face reality like shit richardson oof he would request to enroll at the school fill out the paperwork and it would work Sydney would take advantage of the loose restrictions on transfers at the time put in place to accommodate 24 in high school Yo. Of the, hurricane. the school district would take in anybody who claimed to be one, regardless of how much documentation they didn't have. All Sydney had to do was lie and say he lost everything in the flooding, which is exactly what he did. I'm going to speed up the story now. Rashawn wouldn't stay at Skyline for long. He transferred to another school within the district, Hillcrest, which is where his legend would begin. It was at Hillcrest where Rashawn would quickly demonstrate just how much better he was at basketball than everybody else which again, I'd like to emphasize was because he was seven years older than everybody. But anyways, standing at six foot one, Rashawn quickly became the go-to guy on the team as his teammates would gravitate towards him while he racked up big performance after big performance. He'd go out of state and play the number one team in the nation, scoring 40 points in three quarters, which added even more buzz to his name. 25-year-old Sydney was making quote-unquote friends off the court too. He was basically Hillcrest High School's main character. Did I mention the nigga was 25 years old? Gossip started around the school though. Sydney didn't look super old for a 25 year old, but he damn sure didn't look young. He had the letters S and G tatted on his calves, obviously standing for Sydney Gilstrap, but he would tell kids in the school it stood for shooting guard. No bullshit. He'd have his sister and nephew pull up to games and sit in the crowd, except they weren't his sister and nephew. They were his girlfriend and son. Surrounding spectators would question why the kid was calling Rashawn daddy. Nonetheless, Rashawn was able to infiltrate in peace for a whole nine months undetected he'd lead hillcrest to a mediocre record of 11 and 10 losing in the first round of the playoffs while he averaged over 20 points per game his dominance earned him a district for the nigga oh my gosh he did shit for the fucking team nigga lied for no reason still suck offensive player of the year award at the end of the season as well the facade would soon come to an end though Sometime after March 2018, Rashawn or Sydney decided to suit up and play a couple games at a local AAU tournament. For what reason? I don't know. I mean, I'd assume you want to fly under the radar as much as possible. But anyway, he plays at this local tournament and one of his old coaches who coached him six years earlier spots him. You can only imagine what the coach's immediate reaction was. Boy, ain't no fucking way, boy. Boy, ain't no 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 way, boy. He was, Unless he, he was on this team, I guarantee he would have not said anything. Surprised to hear that the kid who never passed and tussled with his teammates had now been dominating the scene under a fake name. That would mark the end of the charade for Sydney as he'd be arrested in early March on charges of tampering with government documents. Now, this is where the story stops being funny. In July, a girl would come forward claiming that her and Sydney had a romantic relationship. I fucking knew it. I knew it. I was going to mention it, but I, I wanted to. I knew it. I'm like, what if he, he starts. Because he started making friends with the, the guys on the team. I knew he was going to have something with one of the females. Like, some niggas be weird as hell. They be letting that 
that charade get to their head thing and they really that whatever they're trying to portray this shit <clears throat> at the school if that sentence wasn't bad enough in and of itself just listen to this next part the girl was a 14 year old freshman oh yeah lock that nigga up lock him up lock him up yeah now we all knew a couple freak ass seniors or super seniors that dated freshmen it was way too common but this shit is way different i don't even have to point out the obvious illegality sydney put the super in super senior this fool was a super 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 senior <sighs> In January of 2019, police arrested R. Kelly, I mean, Sydney again. An affidavit released by oh, Dallas PD no, told of the it. details. One day while the 14-year-old girl and the suspect were walking through the locker room, the suspect asked her to kiss him and so she did. The girl's statement alleges that Sydney courted her over Snapchat and later drove her to a park, kissing her in the car, touching her breasts over her clothing, and asking her to have sex, which she says she declined. <laughs> Sydney will bail out of jail again, facing one count of indecency with a child, which carries a maximum sentence of 20 years in prison. Of course, he vehemently denied these allegations. In an article published by Sports Illustrated in which they interviewed the victim's mother, she would state, I called Coach Harris multiple times to find out who Rashawn is and what he was about, she says. Coach said he wouldn't want his daughter to date him. He said he's not a bad kid, but he's had a lot of life. He's almost like an adult. Nigga, I wonder why. I would look at my daughter's phone log and she's up at 2 and 3 o'clock talking to him. She was so attached to this boy, she said. After the girl learned the truth that the boy she'd been smitten with was less boy than fully grown man, she was devastated. Her mother spoke about how she would cry hearing gossip about the situation around the school. Soon after, the girl transferred out of Hillcrest. Sydney would go on somewhat of a press tour, doing sit-down interviews and dropping a couple, and I can't make this up, mixtapes. Not hoop mixtapes actual mixtapes and no i'm not playing none of his songs y'all can go find that shit y'all in one interview he'd essentially brag about the whole situation take a look hey you the donkey <laughs> of the day for what reason she uh 25 playing high school basketball hey, <laughs> <that's a legend. laughs> Killing him. <laughs> Killing him. <laughs> Yo. god damn that's like Oh my gosh, there's no way this is real. He bragging and niggas forgetting about that whole 14-year-old. Nah, we ain't, we ain't forget that, buddy. Lame man. Sydney's shitty attempt at a rap career couldn't stop illegal processes, though. As on July 23rd, 2019, he was sentenced to six years probation. Yes, probation. For indecency with a child. And five years probation for tampering with government documents. Common ill from our justice system. Moral of the story, there is no rewind button in life. Also, just don't diddle 14 year old kids. Yo, thank you so much for watching this. If you made it oh, to the what end of that's this. that's it? Where's Dior Johnson at? That's what I was waiting for.